Bishop um, Austin Better. Uh, he is the Bishop of Helena, Montana. So we'll welcome him to the show a little bit later on. Um, we're going to have uh, Michelle Skog with us uh, for our praise and worship in our show. And we have um, worked out some of our uh, technical glitches. And uh, Michelle will join us from the sanctuary of the Cathedral Health tonight with beautiful sounds, um, but even more importantly, uh, um, a beautiful gift of, of music to give glory and praise to God uh, this evening. Uh, as we bear in on the seven uh, o'clock hour here, Mountain Time, we're uh, broadcasting uh, high above the audio Cathedral of Our Lady of Cathedral audio, Hope, uh, at 520 Cathedral Time. Uh, and uh, it's a rainy, cool night, but it's warm with the Holy Spirit here with us in the life of the church. I want to welcome all of you to On the Road. I clicked on this. I clicked on the audio setting. For the link. I clicked on the boom. Uh, Quarantine oh, quiz. Oh, right. You can find that in the, the audio chat. settings. You and then I slid the thing clear over right here. Right here. Okay. You can find the, the quarantine quiz down on the bottom of your screen if you're on your laptop or your tablet. And you'll find that little chat box. In there, you'll see the link to the quarantine quiz. Now, you just can't tap on that. You're going to have to cut and paste that into your web browser so that you can hook up with the quarantine quiz this evening. I think we're about three minutes from quiz time at 7 p.m. tonight, um, but I want to welcome you as you join us here for On the Road to Pentecost. Um, as usual, we'll begin with the diocesan quarantine quiz. You can find that in your chat box. Um, just click on chat. You'll see the link there to the quarantine quiz. You're going to have to um, copy that, cut it, and paste it into your web browser, um, or you have the option of simply cheering me on tonight. Um, and uh, I'm going to get a new name. I am totally getting a new name. Yeah, there we go. Bamboo Esperanza. Is that me? It's not on yet, but I'm going to be Bamboo Esperanza tonight. So you're going to watch that happen uh, and unfold tonight. Um, again, we're excited tonight. Uh, we're going to spend some time in prayer, um, some time in scripture study and looking at the work of the Holy Spirit and the Acts of the Apostles and how that applies to our lives still today in the life of the church. It's the same Holy Spirit at work in the same church, guiding us to the same truths as the early uh, apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we got a great night for you tonight here on the road to Pentecost. We'll be welcoming a little bit later the Bishop of Helena, Montana, um, Bishop Austin Vetter, um, who has uh, been a priest uh, for the Diocese of Bismarck and last year became uh, the Bishop of Helena. Um, the Diocesan Quiz is about to start, um, and so uh, I want to go ahead and uh, make sure that you guys, all of you joining us tonight, have the opportunity uh, to participate in the quiz. Click on the, on the chat box. If you're in the chat box, you can find the link uh, to the um, to the uh, diocesan quiz, you're gonna have to paste that in your browser, whether you're using Chrome or Safari or Internet Explorer, one of those, you're gonna have to paste that link in there and then we'll be ready to play. I am going to share with you um, my screen as I get ready to play the diocesan quiz. Uh, let's make this full blown here, there we go. Um, and we're just waiting now. I am Bamboo Esperanza, which is uh, Esperanza that means hope. Um, and so we'll be soon uh, playing the diocesan quiz. Um, this week, um, we had the great news, uh, and we'll share a little bit more about this in a moment, uh, of Pope Francis yesterday named um, the new bishop, the ninth bishop for the Diocese of Rapid City. Um, and so we'll be uh, visiting a little bit about um, Bishop-elect uh, Peter Muich. Peter Muich um, is our uh, new uh, bishop named here by Pope Francis just yesterday. Um, and he will someday make his way from Duluth, Minnesota, where he is currently the rector of the cathedral there. And start the game. Let's get the game started. I don't know. I'm behind a little bit. Here we go. All right. Di diocesan quarantine quiz. We'll come back to the bishop in a moment. Here's the first question for me. The Bible contains how many books? Of course, I can't see the whole thing here. It's certainly more than one that was blocked by the screen there. 
you're having a what? <laughs> Dang. Okay, the word Bible comes from this must be all about uh all about uh the Bible today. I guess now we're catching on. All right, question number three. God fed the people manna in the desert. The word manna means bread from what? <laughs> Wow, I'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have, to have a little exp, you know, in, uh, tutor, tutorial for your pastor on that one. St. Jerome Famous said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of, there you go, power up. I'm getting encouraged. I'm getting like little encouragements here. All right, here we go. What is happening here? All right, <laughs> I don't know what's happening. All right, the catechism, what's happening? The Catechism teaches that the heart of the scriptures is, no, not Jesus, is not the heart of the scriptures. Moving at a glacier pace. <laughs> Who is sending me this stuff? <laughs> what is typology? All right. How God's works described in the Old Testament prefigure what he accomplished in Jesus in the New Testament. Wow. Here we go. Number seven. Who is the saint who translated the Bible and created the official translation for the Roman Catholic Church, the Vulgate? All right. St. Jerome. All right. The word gospel means what? The good news. The good news. So hot right now. Well, I'm moving up. Number 24. Here we go. We're going to get a redemption question. Redemption question. No, I didn't get it. God fed the people in the desert. The word manna means, no, what is it? That's what it means. What is it? This is news to me. Good news. I'm learning something tonight. What does the canon of scripture mean? A complete list of the books of the Bible, the means by which the Bible were uh, chosen, the means by which the Bible spread, the term for those who read the complete list of the books of the Bible. <laughs> You better let in uh, the bloaties over there. Okay. What did the Catholic Church document define the books should be included in the Bible? Council Trent. <laughs> I'm falling fast. All right. According to the Catholic Church, who should read the Bible? Yeah. Power up. Power up. Come on. Here we go. All right. Wow, we're moving up now. All right. Who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the Bible? Fusion of the faculties. Yes, it's activate. Activate. What is that? There we go. I got to activate. Two times, two times my power? All right. Question number 13. According to the Catholic Church, reading the scriptures should be accompanied by a cup of coffee. <laughs> no, prayer. I'm going to go to prayer tonight. <laughs> The sacred deposit of the word of God is made up of the scripture, and we're going to talk about this tonight. So we're going to talk about sacred scripture and tradition and the magisterium. We're making a comeback here, but we only got one question yet. What famous saint said the New Testament lies hidden in the old, and the old is revealed in the new? We're going to go with that bright light of the early 5th century. Died in 430, St. Augustine of Hippo. I think we got one more redemption question. Let's see. Let's go with that. When did the Catholic Church dogmatically redefine the book should be included in the Bible? Let's go with the Council of Trent in the 16th century. These are correlates. <laughs> Who is going? All done. All right. I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, quarantine quiz. Um, so good to have you with us here on the road to Pentecost. Um, uh, once again, I'm Father Brian Christensen. I'm the pastor of the Cathedral of Our Lady of Perpetual Help uh, here at the Cathedral uh, in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Um, and it's so good that uh, we could all be here tonight. Um, what's happening to my screen there? Are you there? Happen there, so that you can see me fine. All right. Well, welcome again, and uh, let's begin our evening uh, after our quiz on the Bible. I think uh, I ended up uh, up at uh, 14th place, so uh, we're gonna have to work on that a little bit. 
All right, I know uh, I want to welcome uh, Bishop Better here. He's joining us tonight, and I'll be uh, right with uh, that interview coming up at 7.20 on the hour. Um, we'll spend a little time with Bishop Better, the Bishop of Helena, Montana. Um, but right now, let's enter into to prayer as we begin our evening um, in the Holy Spirit on the road to Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father of mercy and love, we thank you for the joy of this Easter season. As you shine the light of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, risen from the tomb upon us and on the whole world, um, he is alive. He has conquered sin and death, and he has brought us into a deeper communion with you through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. May that Holy Spirit inspire our minds and our hearts today. And in the midst of so many difficulties, especially the pandemic, the COVID-19 that affects the whole world, that your light may shine in darkness, your hope may overcome discouragement, your love may triumph over all things. Let your Holy Spirit, the spirit of love, the spirit of truth reign upon us now. Stir up our hearts and our minds to you as we enter into this time of prayer, reflection, and knowledge. This is a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. This is um, chapter 15. Um, it's what's uh, um, referred to in the scriptures as the Council of Jerusalem. Um, Paul has been out uh, evangelizing and teaching um, on his missionary journeys, and he's seen not only um, the Jewish people um, across the Mediterranean basis enter into a relationship of faith in Jesus Christ, but he's also seen the Holy Spirit enter into the lives of Gentiles, of non-Jewish uh, people uh, of the Mediterranean basin, and they've entered into this relationship with the Lord. They've been baptized. Um, and then there's grown a dispute uh, whether or not um, these non-Jewish converts to the way, to the Christian life, to becoming uh, followers of Jesus Christ, um, should or should not um, first observe the rules and law, uh, the Jewish law, um, all of the prescriptions uh, of the ancient law of Israel. Um, and it centers around should they um, be circumcised, should they follow the Jewish way before entering into faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul's position is no, he should, they should enter straight into by faith because it's not by the law by which the people of Israel were saved, um, but by their faith in Jesus Christ. And so this comes to the point where um, it needs to be discussed. And so Paul uh, goes up with Barnabas to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles in this council of the apostles. Uh, and here I want to pick it up in um, chapter 15, verse um, 19 and following. Now, St. James, uh, uh, the head of the church in Jerusalem, is the one who's speaking here. So we're going to hear James speak to all of the apostles gathered at this moment in Jerusalem over this question about the Gentile or the non-Jewish converts to the way. It is my judgment Therefore, that we ought to stop troubling the Gentiles who turn to God, but tell them by letter to avoid pollution from idols, unlawful marriage, the meat of strangled animals, and blood. So James comes uh, at this moment and comes to a conclusion after Paul has presented his evidence, after Peter has presented his evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the non-Jewish converts. Then it continues in verse 22 of chapter 15. Then the apostles and presbyters, in agreement with the whole church, decided to choose representatives and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. The ones chosen were Judas, who was called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers. This is the letter delivered by them. So these men were charged with carrying the letter from the council out to the churches in Asia Minor, Minor and across uh, the Mediterranean. This is the, le de le the letter that was to be delivered to the churches. The apostles and the presbyters, your brothers, to the brothers in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, of Gentile origin, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number who went out without any mandate from us have upset you with their teachings and disturbed your peace of mind, we have, with one accord, decided to choose representatives and to send them to you, along with our brother Barnabas and Paul who have dedicated their lives to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are sending Judas and Silas, 
who will also convey this same message by word of mouth. It is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us not to place on you any burden beyond these necessities, namely to abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats of strangled animals, and from unlawful marriage. If you keep free of these, you will be doing what is right. Farewell. All right. Um, what a, uh, a moment in the early life of the church. Um, one that um, we can probably um, recognize if we have um, a sense of, of the recent history of the church um, with the Second Vatican Council. Um, the councils of the church um, have been called throughout the ages um, over these 2,000 years, um, 22 councils in total, um, in order for the Holy Spirit to guide the church um, in matters of faith and morals, and even in pastoral care, the best ways to care for the people of the church. But we hear here, right here at the very origins of the church in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 15, that it is the Holy Spirit at work who calls together these apostles. Paul and Barnabas come from their experience of the con conversion of um, these people in Antioch and Cilicia and um, throughout Assyria, they come back to Jerusalem to check with the, the apostles to say, what is the best way forward? What is it that God desires for his church? Huh? And Peter also comes back after his experiences um, and how the Holy Spirit has indeed come upon these non-Jewish um, believers, that they have come also to know Jesus Christ, know the salvation in the Lord Jesus, and have um, accepted the faith. Um, and so the Holy Spirit guides the disciples, the apostles, this council um, of the shepherds of the church um, into the fullness of truth. This is the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised would continue to guide his apostles and their successors in the fullness of the truth. You know, what comes of this council is the teaching, as the apostles say, that of the Holy Spirit. It is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us, right? They're seeking the truth that comes from God. And they convey that through this letter out to the whole church. It circulates around. It's the origin of the encyclical letters. In other words, these encyclicals that we hear about the Pope's um, teaching and preaching that are passed around to the church, now sent through the internet, but sometimes published and put on our bookshelves, but is it, they're intended to be teachings of the magisterium or the teaching authority of the church. We see this so beautifully played out here in the early church, and it will be the way that the church um, continues to operate through the ages, right up to our own day, that the leaders of the church, those chosen successors to the apostles, will gather at time to time in council. Um, the last worldwide or ecumenical council was back in the 1960s, 1962 to 1963, uh, 65, the Second Vatican Council. Um, and there, guided by the Holy Spirit, they brought forth dogmatic constitutions, teachings on dogma, but also on teachings on pastoral care um, uh, and, and other issues um, of the church that they sought, the counsel of the Holy Spirit in collaboration with one another, um, and then sent out uh, documents um, for the good of the church so that we would all know the fullness of truth as God reveals it. These are important truths for us to, to keep in mind as we make our way to Pentecost. But the, it is the Holy Spirit that guides the early church. Huh? Right now, before, before this happens, you know, this, uh, this Council of Jerusalem, there are few, if any, documents um, uh, of the church. Right? We don't have the letters of St. Paul yet. The first letters of St. Paul appear around the year 47, 48 AD. They're his letters to the Thessalonians, are believed to be the first written documents of the New Testament. Um, also, the, the, um, the Gospels uh, are written um, in the, uh, the 50s, uh, in the 70s, and even John's Gospels into the 90s AD. Um, and so here the church is already unfolding living out its life, as we saw in the second uh, chapter of Acts of the Apostles, already living out a life of community, already living a life uh, of sacramental life, of the, of, 
of uh, baptism, of the Eucharist, uh, of healing, of the descent of the Holy Spirit, the sense of confirmation. We're already living a life of charity, um, of common life. We're already guided by the Holy Spirit to the, to the unfolding teachings of the way in which God wishes to draw people to himself. Uh, and so um, we have this life of the church um, unfolding. And this is where we have the beginnings of sacred tradition. How has the church always lived throughout the ages, from the beginning to this day? right? That there is a lived experience guided by the Holy Spirit that we would be joined to Christ um, and into the life of the Trinity from the very beginning, from the very beginning. And then guided once again by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, um, just as we had in our quarantine quiz tonight, we have the sacred scriptures, the Bible, this um, collection of inspired and inerrant um, guidance, the truth, that God wishes to convey to us the, the, the word of God communicated to us in human words. Inspired authors who write down what God wishes to reveal to us about himself and his design for us and for the world. So we have sacred tradition, these ongoing practices of the life of the church um, that exist all the way to our day, guided by the Holy Spirit, and the sacred scriptures, again, inspired by the Holy Spirit and guided by the church. It was the church Ultimately, that made the decision of what um, books were the inspired works of the Holy Spirit. Again, the apostles and their successors, um, guided by the truth of the Holy Spirit, decided which scriptures would be included in the canon or the rule uh, of, this, of the Bible. Um, now, I've talked about sacred tradition and sacred scripture, but we've also, in the background, constantly talked about the apostles and their successors. It was to them, this teaching um, authority uh, of the church, that the Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would guide them in all truth. And so it is the, up to the magisterium or this teaching authority of the church, the apostles and their successors, our bishops today, in communion with Peter and his successors, the Bishop of Rome, our Pope, um, that the truth would be conveyed, that the interpretation, the guarding of the sacred tradition, and the guarding of the truths of sacred scripture would be handed on to us. Without the, this three-legged stool, if you will, if you picture that this stool with three legs, the sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium, um, they're all necessary to hold up um, the life and the teachings of the church. And it's the same Holy Spirit at work in tradition. It's the same Holy Spirit at work in scriptures. It's the same Holy Spirit that guides the magisterium in the ways of faith and morals. Without the three legs, the stool falls over. We take away sacred tradition. We don't have the fullness of the life of Christ that has been passed down to the we Take away sacred scripture. We don't have the fullness of life. And if we take away the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, then who who has God given authority to guide us? Would he leave us without the possibility of knowing the truth? That it would be up to every single individual conscience to know what this particular passage of sacred scripture would mean or what it was intended to be handed down in tradition? That would be chaos. It would be constant division, constant quarreling of who was right and who was stronger. No, God has not left us in this lurch. He has guided us in the fullness of truth through the sacred magisterium, the apostles and their successors. Um, and that is the beautiful gift that God has given us today in his church. And we have the gift of tradition. We have the gift of sacred scripture. And we have the gift of the magisterium. And we're blessed in our diocese, as I said earlier, to welcome a new successor to the apostles, Bishop-elect uh, Peter Mewich, um, a priest currently of the, the Diocese of Duluth, but now um, the bishop-elect of the Diocese of Rapid City. It's very uh, beautiful that he was named yesterday. And today, um, the bishop-elect um, celebrates his 59th birthday on this memorial of Our Lady of Fatima. So our prayers are with Bishop-elect Mewich um, on his birthday and the celebration for us as the people of God in Western South Dakota to welcome our new successor to the Apostles, um, Bishop-elect Peter Mewich. Welcome to our new bishop.
At this time, I want to welcome another successor to the apostles, one who shares in that magisterial responsibilities of teaching and guarding the truths that have been handed down to us. Um, I want to introduce uh, to you this evening um, Bishop Austin Vetter. Bishop Vetter uh, joins us from Helena, Montana. Um, welcome, Bishop Vetter. Good to have you with us on the road to Pentecost. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. How are you all? We're doing well. We're doing That's well. Right. You can't talk. I got to show you. I have to show you. Yeah, I mean, you live in a what nice area. What are you going to show area. us tonight? I mean, you live in a nice area. Mm. Wow. What a beautiful it's... evening you guys have. But it's not Helena. Where are you? Right there. That's where I live. That's Helena? That's, yep, that's Mount Ascension right there. Okay. All right. So, I live here. They made me a oh, bishop. That's awesome. The heck they're thinking. When I saw Pope Francis during the Ad Limina, he said to me, you're so young. I said, that's your fault. <laughs> what do you mean? Is that too bright? I got to sit someplace else. Um, what, what, what and by the way, by the way, I want you to yeah. know, I took the fourth place in your <laughs> I guess that's why I, know. I guess that's why I'm the bishop and you're the rector that is probably very true I uh, I suffered <laughs> this is my this is my worst that's why my worst showing in four weeks I think well and you know what's even more pathetic you actually wrote the questions <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, you know I, I keep lucky. all of that secret you guys are lucky you got a bishop when you did because I was just ready now to get my troops down and go and take Rapid City and, and make it part of uh, Dice's Helena. I could use the Rapid City. Oh, yeah. We're, we're a beautiful place. We got great people. Uh, but, uh, hey, Bishop, um, yeah. tell, tell, us, tell us all about where you grew up and what was the influence of, of your community and your family on your faith? Yeah, I grew up in Linton, North Dakota. Straight north of uh, Harriet, South Dakota. Straight north of there. Se Shelby, Selby, Shelby, Selby, how the heck you say it? Selby, yeah, right, Selby. Selby, straight north. Okay. Um, on a farm, 1,200 acres, youngest of 12 kids. All 12 of us are born in 14 years. So born and raised there. Linton's a town of 1,200 people now. Okay. Um, so grew up on a farm and then went to NDSU and went to this little church when I got named Bishop. Now that's a strange thing. My What's gosh, that? getting named a bishop. That's a strange <laughs> phone call. I have a feeling they did it the same way as they did Matthias. They just drew lots. Because if they had a read if they'd have read anything about me, they'd have said, Not him. I told them when they, someone interviewed me and they said, What's the criteria? I said, I have no idea because I wouldn't have picked me. But I don't get to pick. You don't get to pick. You don't get They're to chosen. pick. Yep. So none of it's known, but uh, and when I got named, I went back to little St. Michael's where I grew up, little country church out in the middle of nowhere. <clears throat> got to drive, you know, five miles gravel roads to get to it. And uh, I had mass out there, all these German Russians, farmers. And it was like I was at a funeral. They were all crying. I said, stop crying. You don't cry. You're going to get your emotions all mixed up. All you know is anger. And they were <laughs> laughing. But it was so touching because uh, I, it, it dawned on me in the homily. I just said to them, little did you know that you were raising an apostle. A successor to the apostles mm -hmm. that the one true faith is is here in this small little community it's not different it's not weak it's not kind of catholic it's just as catholic as any other place in time in history uh, and it's handing on the one true faith that jesus gave to us that's what's so humbling listening to you describe a bishop that always gives me a little heartburn every time people are describing bishops these days i scratch my head it's quite a thing, you know, can't think about it too much and go crazy. Um, let's talk a little bit about before you became bishop, uh, you uh, had the experience of being a spiritual director at a seminary. Could you talk about what that was? What, 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 what was your responsibilities as a spiritual director? I was the spiritus directus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. Yes, you were. I was on faculty with Father Brian and Father Christensen at the North American <laughs> College. I was over there for six years. Um, as the head spiritual director. And you know, when you're, you're talking about Pentecost and the working of the Holy Spirit, you know, so often uh, it was so humbling because to be able to be, so basically as the spiritual director, you get to sit in on uh, very personally the relationship between this seminarian or this person and God. Um, he's the one directing them. He's the one moving. 
many times as the spiritual director, you can actually see very clearly what God's doing, but the person doesn't see it yet. Right. And then you have to be patient enough to let the Holy Spirit, as Pope Francis says, be the protagonist, the one who goes first, not to go out in front of him, to let he, him be the primary actor and mover, that it's too easy. You know, if I saw a young man, I could easily say to him, why are you doubting being a priest? It's clear as the day that God is calling you to be a priest. But you have to let that mature within them, that you can't get ahead of them. Uh, that you have to accompany them in that journey, but you get to see the Holy Spirit very much at work uh, in all of it, you know. Yeah, um, no, it was really beautiful. I, you know, one of the things that I think uh, that you often um, focused on is coming into that relationship with Christ and his mother as, as real people. Uh, why, why, why was that such a focus for you? What were the challenges that that those men faced, or, or even I think any Christian probably faces with a relationship with Jesus and his mother. It's the biggest thing that we intellectual get the answer right. Yes, they're real people, they're real persons. But then how we relate with them, we wouldn't relate to any person that way. We try to relate in a way that's not human. And we're human, that's the only way we can relate. And so uh, we try to put them back on a pedestal or make them a plastic statue or have them distant, but they're right here, right? Uh, and they personally encounter us and want us to encounter them. So that was the biggest thing is to really help seminarians, but any of us, I, I was just saying, um, I just met with Carroll College. We have a diocesan college here. And I was telling the kids, they're asking me questions, the students. And I said, I have a deal for you. I want to meet your friends. And one lady said, one girl said, I don't know if you're going to like some of them. I said, no, I'd like to meet your friends. But under one condition, you got to meet my friends. Their names are Peter, James, John, Andrew, Jesus, Mary, Joseph. They're real people. And I can introduce you to them. Mm -hmm. And they want to meet you. I always would tell the seminarians, you know, Jesus could have picked angels to be priests, I suppose. They would sing a lot better. Their homilies would be better. They would never make a mistake. But he didn't want angels. He wanted friends to be his priests. Right? He wanted humans. Um, and so that daily friendship is so important, not only in the life of a priest or a bishop, but in any disciple, um, that it's, it's so important. And that's really the work of the Holy Spirit. It's that, that friendship, right? It's the friendship between the Father and the Son, the love. Between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. So that means love that I have between Jesus and I, that's the Holy Spirit that we're sharing in the life of the Spirit of Jesus himself as we encounter his love. Just as, you know, it, it, in, a, in a real sense, huh? The, when we look at our lives, we're a mess. <laughs> we're a mess. And so he enters our lives to walk with us and to be with us in it. And to forgive us and nourish us and strengthen us and to bring us home. Uh, that we're on a journey back to him now. Um, but, you know, as working in a seminary, that was really privileged time. It really was. I had enough, holy was it's holy ground for sure. Yeah. I had to correct most of the things that the vice rector did wrong. <laughs> well, we don't know who that was. So we're not going to mention, <laughs> we're not gonna mention him tonight. So listen, uh, <laughs> uh, in, uh, in your work, in your walk with the Lord yourself, you know, the, the movement of the Holy Spirit in your own priesthood, and now as a bishop, what, how, how do you kind of, how would you describe the way that the Holy Spirit has moved your mind, your heart, your life in these, toward you know, priesthood? Yeah, obviously he acts directly, but also many times, the difference between us and the apostles, they had immediate contact. Many times with us, it's, it's through intermediaries, right? It's through others, it's through instruments, you know? And you don't know at the time what instrument the Spirit of God is using to, to come to me in a particular way, with maybe a word that's given or an encouragement or whatever it might be. I remember when the nuncio left, it was really two things, you know, so the Pope's representative uh, to the United States, he's the one who called me that I was going to be the next Bishop of Helena. And he could tell I was nervous on the phone. And uh, he said, uh, do you have any questions? I said, yes, I have a ton. I just don't know what they are yet. 
And he laughed. He said, well, you call if you have any questions. But he told me, he said, Austin, you be yourself. Pope Francis and Jesus chose Austin better to be the bishop, not someone else. And we know you. We know you better than you think. And be yourself. He said, if you're yourself, be the, what God has made you to be. Just be that. Use your gifts. You're going to come to love this life. If you're going to try to be someone you're not, you're going to hate it. And that's a good advice to all of us. Yeah, I think you know, the, 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 Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does call us to authenticity, so that's great to see. I want, I want you to share a little bit, like, in, these are difficult days across the world, across the country, um, in our dioceses, in our parishes. People are um, at home, not, you know, not out working. Their, their kids are back in, you know, in the homes, you know. I know in Helena, I think they're back to masses. Uh, we're starting masses here in Western South Dakota this coming weekend, but it's been a difficult run. There are people who are financially uh, challenged. There are people who are help, who have lost loved ones across uh, um, our states, um, and those who are sick and those who are caring for them. Um, what's been your kind of uh, pastoral approach? I mean, you've been very creative and working with your priests and some interesting things. That, uh, yeah. It's crazy. I would have never thought I've been a bishop less than six months that this is how it would start out. Um, and so having to do things, you know, there's no guidebook. Um, you know, people have been calling now because we were the first dioceses. We were the first state to open back up. And so we were getting phone calls from all over the place, all over the world, mm -hmm. um, asking about it and wanting to do things. And uh, someone asked, so how did you decide? I said, well, it's not rocket science. It can't be because I'm not a rocket scientist. <laughs> so it can't be that. I said, I'm just making decisions as I would as in a family. That's it. What would I do in a family or in a, in a parish uh, for the people entrusted to my care? I don't have to worry about the whole world. Mm -hmm. I have the Diocese of Helena. And so I just simply tried to beg the Holy Spirit, and I did every day, send me your gift of wisdom prudence to make good decisions and then try to you know uh, follow the advice of those areas the people that have more expertise than i do about health and things and uh and then take the steps encourage and but my big thing is you can't be afraid you can't be afraid you can't act out of fear and you can't not act because if you don't make a decision you've made a decision by not making a decision and then it just dictates and, and you, you, you know, it's better to, to, to decide and to own it and make it your own. And when I make a mistake, I knew from the first day I did it, I did little videos. I told them, I'll be the first one to say that was a bad idea. And then we start over. Um, if we're just going to be waiting until there's no risk, I, I don't mean just with a pandemic, with anything, we, we won't do anything. Yeah. We're just too afraid to, to fail. Um, and the fact is, you know, we believe that Jesus is with us, that he sent us his Holy Spirit, that his people have faith too, and we listen to their voices. Um, and then at the end of the day, I got to make some decisions. And those are mine. And the thing is, I, <laughs> I got great advice from an, uh, a lawyer uh, who was a prosecuting attorney. And he said, uh, or a judge, he was a judge. He said, Usually at the end of a ruling, if both sides were mad at me, I figured it was probably the right decision. <laughs> well, as we opened up here, I got all sorts of sides. And so it's probably we're doing it as well as we can. No, oh, so, it, it is very challenging. And uh, yeah, thank you for your witness and your faithfulness. Um, you have been uh, reading stories online for kids. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> I got my favorite story coming up next week. I'm going to wait for it. Up? So the big, is, mouth, the big these... mouth frog, man. It's the fine frog. Story. So you've been, read, you've been little, reading to the little kids? Little kids. I had this little girl Monday, four years old. Her mom pulls up in her little minivan. She opens the window. She's screaming, Bishop Vetter, Bishop Vetter. And so I'm like, what's going on? So the mom stops, this little girl jumps out, and she's just a magpie, just talking away. I had never seen her before. So her mom gets out, I meet her, and I said, I'm Bishop Better, and she said, oh my gosh, my little girl listens to you read constantly. <laughs> she, you're her favorite person. And so yesterday was her fifth birthday, and so she brought me a cupcake. She told her mom, we gotta take the bishop a cupcake. 
so they brought me a cupcake for her birthday. But I've been reading these books and then have little messages for them. I got a beautiful letter from a mom who said to her daughter, isn't that amazing? The bishop even remembers you. You're part of his flock just as much as I am. And so I've been trying to, I've sent some videos to the prison, um, to prisoners, uh, and I got a letter from a prisoner uh, thanking me wow, for it, uh, for Holy Week. Um, so I just sent one out to the graduating seniors, um, not only from high school, but also college. Um, so different groups, just trying to be creative. Yeah. I got nothing to do. So <laughs> Just like you, no, you got no, nothing to do. No, That's I wish. Really that's why you're on this Zoom thing. Yeah, I know. I got nothing to do with it. Make these 40 people suffer through you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, um, before you go, um, so while these are difficult times and challenging times, I think we've seen a lot of creativity, um, a lot of uh, uh, charity uh, on the part of our people, um, the people of God. What, what um, for you, where have you seen like beautiful moments uh, in these, what, what many people would call dark days. There's been lots of lights, I think. Yeah, there have. I've received I, I, almost every day a letter from someone. I, I re just uh, beautiful testaments of faith of uh, kind of a little wake up call of, gosh, I didn't, I didn't think that much of it right away, but it's only been six weeks and without mass and I hate it we need mass back you know we're made we're not made to be in isolation we're made for community we're made for union with one another and with god and so this isolation goes away against goes against the way god made us and so we know it's temporary we won't we, we can't we can't live like this for the next 40 years um and it's not just because of the economy it's not just because you know it's because we're made for each other and so Zoom can, you know, hold us together a little bit, but it doesn't replace person-to-person -person contact, you know. And, and the sacraments, they're, they're encounters with people, and you have to become close with one another in sacraments. That's the uniquely Catholic thing that mm -hmm. uh, is a challenge. But I think in awakening, if we're open to it, you know, the challenge is any of these things. God has tons of grace opportunities that he's opening up to us. But we can reject him. You know, we have to respond in faith and ask him. Ask the Holy Spirit, you show us. You show us the way. I want to leave you one last thing. I know I have to let you go here. Okay. When I when Pierre, when Archbishop Pierre left Helena, he told me, Bishop Better, you're a missionary bishop. This is a missionary territory. You everything about you has to be missionary. Your schools, your hospitals, your university, everything's missionary. So I nodded. I came to the chancery. I told the chancery. I said, so we're all missionaries. And they all nod. I said, do any of you know what that means? They all got quiet. I said, because I don't. I said, I'm a great maintainer. Maintaining it, not losing it. What's it mean to be missionary? And I think having to shut down has made the church creative in saying, how do I reach people? Calling all our parishioners on the phone um, through, you know, live streaming masses. Uh, reading books to kids, you know, just having this human outreach uh, as people of faith that uh, there's something very basic about it. We're back to some like stepping stones, some firm foundations that we have to find. I think for me, the biggest grace and probably the biggest challenge, I don't know the last time as a whole country this many families eating together as a family consistently for this long for better or worse but it really made families i was out walking and to see parents both parents out there playing with their kids uh with no other kids around just the family unit mm -hmm. um i think that's a real um grace of this a real grace of this and i told the college kids if i were you I'd drive around town and see which businesses are still open, and I would change my major to an essential service. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop Vetter, uh, greetings. Happy Easter to you. Uh, thank you for spending your evening with us. Absolutely. Um,
we look forward to welcoming you. Maybe you can come down to the uh, ordination of uh, Bishop Mewich. Uh, some that would be great. I'd, I'd love to be able to. And, and I want to tell all the people who are listening in, and I mean this, you are very, very fortunate to have Father Brian Christensen as your pastor. I tell you what, you really are. He's one of the finest priests I know. And I mean that. And I miss him. I miss you, Brian. That, uh, yeah. But know, know that you're very fortunate. You are all in good hands with him. Uh, work him. He's got a lot of energy. Don't let him get lazy on you. Okay. All right. Hey, listen, we're going to turn you off now. Uh, and, uh, we'll catch you off air at another time. But I really do appreciate it. Thanks for your words of wisdom. Uh, God bless you in your ministry and the people of Helena. Keep up the good pray work. For You're pray, pray for me, please. Pray for me. Got okay. it. Okay. Right. Thanks. Okay, God bless. Thank you, Bishop Vetter. God bless. Have a good night. <laughs> wow, what a very uh, wonderful, inspirational time uh, with Bishop Vetter. Uh, as you can see, uh, he took the advice of the uh, Nuncio to heart. Um, be yourself. Um, that's the kind of uh, um, man he is, faithful and true and honest. Um, prayerful, dedicated, um, and uh, and it came out in his priesthood, and it continues in his Episcopal ministry uh, as the uh, successors of the apostle, uh, successors of the apostles um, in Helena, Montana. Um, next week, uh, we get to welcome a, another successor to the apostles um, on the road to Pentecost. We'll have Bishop Stephen Beegler. Bishop Stephen um, will be joining us here. The former rector of the cathedral uh, of Our Lady Perpetual Help, um, grew up in Timberlake, South Dakota, um, and uh, served here in our diocese uh, for many years before uh, Pope Francis chose him to be the Bishop of Cheyenne. So Bishop Stephen Beagle will be uh, with us next week uh, on the road to Pentecost. At this time, I want to move over to a little praise and worship uh, with uh, Michelle Skog, who will lead us um, in time of prayer um, through the beautiful gift of song, uh, and music. So please uh, join in uh, with Michelle tonight as we give glory and praise to God. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. So I loved how the bishop talked to us about us not being made for isolation, that we really, this is hard for us and we need each other. So um, I just like to pray with you, draw me close. A lot of you probably know this, so sing along at home. And this is just a prayer for us to cling to Jesus right now. Lord, just draw us close to you. This isolation is hard, but we are never isolated from you. You are always with us. It's us that kind of back away from you sometimes, Lord. But Lord, just draw us close to you, especially during this time. Draw me close to you. Never let me I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. Nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, Lord, bring me back to you. Ah. 
me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again. To hear you say I'm a friend. Sometimes it's hard to see it, but you are always, you are always near us, Lord. And the bishop also talked about the beauty that we're able to see during this time. And um, that was that was just so uplifting what he talked about. But um, this next song, "How Great Is Our God," let's just praise the Lord for the beauty that He does give us in the midst of struggle. And I think we really will look back at this time in our life and and we'll cherish parts of it. Yes, it's very hard, but we will cherish beauty that we saw along the way when all the distractions were taken away and we were just able to see God's beauty. This is uh, how great is our God. Day 
situation stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the godhead three in one father spirit son the lion and the lamb the lion and the lamb, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, that all the world will see, how great is our God. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, Lord, for the many blessings of this evening and the way that you shower your Holy Spirit upon us. Thank you for this uh, gift of praise that we give you worship and thanksgiving, that we recognize your greatness, uh, the greatness that's revealed in your mercy, uh, that you reveal by the power of your Holy Spirit at work in the life of the church and her sacramental life and her sacred scriptures in her wonderful traditions and in her uh, magisterium that teaches us and guides us. Lord, we give you thanks and praise how great you are. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Appreciate you joining us once again. And uh, tonight, uh, right from the sanctuary here at Our Lady of Perpetual Health Cathedral. Thank you for, for sharing that as well. All right, before we finally wrap up here, invoking the Holy Spirit and the litany of the Holy Spirit, I just want to call to mind a few things. One, once again, continue to keep uh, Bishop-elect uh, Peter Muich, Peter Muich uh, in uh, your prayers, especially on his birthday today on this uh, Memorial of Our Lady uh, of Fatima. Um, there is no timetable right now for his ordination as the Bishop of the Diocese of Rapid City. So um, be, be patient, um, continue to pray for him, pray for our diocese. And once again, many thanks to uh, um, Father Mike Malloy, uh, who has served so uh, wonderfully uh, for these last uh, 10 plus months um, as our diocesan administrator uh, through very challenging and, and difficult times. So uh, our prayers will continue to go out to our, our administrator, Father Mike Malloy. Um, we are returning, as you know, to Masses at the Cathedral this Saturday night at 5.30 and then Sunday and then throughout the week. Um, please check the website, uh, cathedralolph.org, cathedralolph.org for details. And you're going to need tickets uh, for Saturday and Sunday um, in order to attend Mass. It's not, there's no cost and it's not intended to keep you out. It's intended to help us control um, the number of people so that we can keep proper spacing and social distancing. Um, keep everybody safe as we return to the most holy sacrifice of the mass and our reception of holy communion um the encounter uh our praise and worship our time of adoration opportunities for confession and prayer um will be this saturday the 16th every third saturday of the month is the encounter and that will be open 
uh, beginning uh, to uh, Saturday. Uh, that goes from 7, 8, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, it is 7 p.m. We've moved it back a half hour, so it begins at 7, not 7.30. It begins at seven. Join us for 10 minutes, join us for a half hour, join us for the whole holy hour uh, from seven to 8 p.m. this Saturday, the encounter. Um, and then also tomorrow, uh, Pope Francis has asked us to join in with all of our brothers and sisters across the world in an ecumenical and interreligious time of prayer, fasting, and works of charity uh, for the end of the pandemic, for the um, enlightenment of those who are working for a cure, our scientists, and also for healing for those who are sick. Um, again, it's a worldwide day of prayer for the end of the pandemic, prayer, fasting, and works of charity. That's tomorrow, May uh, 14th, throughout the day. You'll be joining people from across the world uh, and with our Holy Father, Pope Francis, uh, as we seek God's, um, God's grace in these difficult moments. So once again, prayers for our Bishop-elect, uh, we got the encounter coming up Saturday night. We got masses on Saturday and Sunday, and uh, we got a day of prayer, fasting, and uh, works of charity tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of great things that God is doing in these difficult times. Um, let's be attentive. Uh, once again, thanks to Bishop Vetter, um, and we look forward to welcoming Bishop Beagler next Wednesday on the road to Pentecost. At this time, I invite you to please join me in the litany uh, of the Holy Spirit. I need to share my screen. I'm glad I got my coach here. There we go. Share screen. There we go. Let's do it. Share. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Father, all-powerful, Jesus, eternal Son of the Father, Redeemer of the world, Spirit of the Father and the Son, boundless life of both, Holy Trinity, Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, who are equal to the Father and the Son, Promise of God the Father, have mercy on us. ray of heavenly light, have mercy on us. author of all good, have mercy on us. source of heavenly water, have mercy on us. consuming fire, have mercy on us. ardent charity, have mercy on us. spiritual unction, have mercy on us. spirit of love and truth, have mercy on us. spirit of wisdom and understanding, have mercy on us. spirit of counsel and fortitude, have mercy on us. spirit of knowledge and piety, have mercy on us. Spirit of fear of the Lord, have mercy on us. Spirit of grace and prayer, have mercy on us. Spirit of peace and meekness, have mercy on us. Spirit of modesty and innocence, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit the Comforter, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit the Sanctifier, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit who governs the church, have mercy on us. Gift of God, the Most High. Have mercy on us. Spirit who fills the universe. Have mercy on us. Spirit of adoption of the children of God. Have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, inspire us with horror of sin. Holy Spirit, come and renew the face of the earth. Holy Spirit, shed thy light in our souls. Holy Spirit, engrave thy law in our hearts. Holy Spirit, inflame us with the flame of thy love. Holy Spirit, open to us the treasures of thy grace. Holy Spirit, teach us to pray well. Holy Spirit, enlighten us with thy heavenly inspiration. Holy Spirit, lead us in the way of salvation. Holy Spirit, grant us the only necessary knowledge. Holy Spirit, inspire in us the practice of good. Holy Spirit, grant us the merits of all virtue. Holy Spirit, make us persevere in justice. Holy Spirit, be thou our everlasting Redeemer. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Send us thy grace. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Pour down into our souls the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us the spirit of wisdom and piety. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful Father, that thy divine spirit may enlighten, inflame, and purify us, that he may penetrate us with his heavenly dew, and make us fruitful in good works. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who with thee, in the unity of the same Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, signing off from high above 520 Cathedral Drive, here at the broadcasting booth of the Cathedral Our Lady of Perpetual Help, it's Father Brian Christensen on the road to Pentecost. Until next week, um, we'll see ya.
See you on the internet. See you on Zoom. See you at Mass this weekend. God bless you. Come, Holy Spirit.